Hi, everyone. I'm Brandon Coombs, and today I'll be talking about the genetics of bipolar disorder. And this is work that I've done with uh, Kevin O'Connell and myself uh, for the Early Career Researcher Reviews papers. So to start this off, the uh, definition of, of bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is marked by shifts in mood, energy, and activity levels. And you can see here on the right is a plot of what this might look like for someone who has bipolar type 1 in which that this person started off having a severe depression episode and then that slowly transitioned into something that's more normal and then they had a uh, uh, they transitioned to mania and then eventually went back down and that happened over a certain amount of time maybe months maybe years and that's what a uh, bipolar disorder can look like bipolar disorder is has high clinical heterogeneity and that i mean that people with bipolar disorder can look very different based on their clinical presentation. So people might have BD type 1 or type 2. So the type 1 will reach the full manic state. Type 2 doesn't quite reach that full manic state and might only come to hypomania. Uh, type 2 is also more likely to experience the uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, people have rapid cycling in bipolar disorder, and some people don't. And rapid cycling is talking about this time frame down here below, which is that some people are cycling back and forth fast and some aren't. And, and rapid cycling is defined as having three or more episodes in a year. Some people with bipolar disorder have melancholic features, atypical features, uh, there's psychosis in bipolar disorder. Uh, and that psychosis can either happen in depression or it can happen in mania. There's also catatonia, uh, peripartum onset, and seasonality to the disorder. So some people might experience depression during winter. Um, so there's a certain seasonality aspect. And in general, there's a sort of uh, uh, transition here of what these different uh, mood states could look like as you move along the, the uh, range here. So speaking of epidemiology here, there's a lifetime prevalence of 1% for each type, bipolar type 1 or type 2. And bipolar disorder is actually ranked 17th in global burden disease, uh, and it has a mean age onset of 20 years. And typically, early age of onset, which we define as usually in your teenage years of developing bipolar disorder, that's associated with poorer prognosis and increased comorbidity. And bipolar disorder also has a potential for misdiagnosis in, in early onset. So once people are first developing bipolar disorder, uh, depressive symptoms can look like uh, MDD at first if they haven't experienced mania. Also, if they their first time they're coming in is through a psycho psychotic episode, they could be misdiagnosed as having schizophrenia. Uh, there's also cases that are misdiagnosed with ADHD or, or reverse that ADHD is misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder. So there's a lot of misdiagnosis. And as I mentioned before, there's a high comorbidity in bipolar disorder. At least 90% of uh, people with bipolar disorder have at least one uh, lifetime comorbid disorder. And 70% of people with bipolar disorder have three or more. And some of these comorbid com comorbidities include anxiety disorders, which uh, make up a majority of what the comorbidities are. Uh, there's substance use disorders, ADHD, personality disorders, and also eating disorders. So moving on to the genetics, or we're talking about the genetics of bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar disorder is highly heritable. So in fact, it's 60 to 90% heritability. And here on the right, you can see bipolar disorder is, is lined up with all the other different psychiatric disorders. And it tends to be towards the highest uh, psych, uh, heritability among all the psychiatric disorders. And here you see either heritability measured from twins or heritability measured from the SNPs. And it also has a high genetic correlation with other psychiatric disorders. In this paper that was published last year, it was shown that bipolar disorder has the largest genetic overlap with schizophrenia. And it also has a pretty large genetic overlap with depression. But it also has uh, overlap with all of these other different traits, such as uh, anorexia, OCD, ADHD, and autism. 
But the biggest breakthroughs for bipolar disorder have really come through the through GWAS. And when when GWAS first started for bipolar disorder was in 2007 through the Wellcome Trust. There were only 2,000 cases and 3,000 controls, and zero genome-wide significant loci um, were found in that, that original GWAS. And that's where we saw that we're going to need a much larger sample size to find anything that's associated with, with bipolar disorder, even though this is such a highly heritable trait. And now, after the latest GWAS was just posted on, on MedArchive, Met uh, the latest GWAS has over 40,000 cases and over 350,000 controls, and now we have 64 genome-wide significant loci. So we've made quite a bit of improvements as we've moved along through the years. Um, but still, only 15 to 18% of the variance is explained in this latest sample. But fortunately, we've now reached an inflection point in bipolar disorder. So here on this graph on the right, we can see here bipolar disorder is here with our recruitment, and it's expected that as we move along, we will now start to increase the number of loci explaining, or we'll start to increase how much uh, variance we can explain as we add um, more and more people. And we'll, we'll need to add not as many as we have had to before. So we actually are missing a lot of the very uh, heritability here. So only 15 to 18% of the variance is explained, but, but bipolar disorder has a high heritability. So that's what we, we deem the missing heritability problem. And uh, in the next few slides, I'm gonna go over the different hypotheses of, of missing heritability. And one of the common ones is that we're actually leaving out genetic interactions and genetic interactions being gene environment or gene-gene interactions. But so far in bipolar disorder, these have been understudied, uh, as you might imagine, and they're not well replicated. So uh, unlike the main effects for GWAS, gene, gene environment interactions or gene-gene interactions usually take around four times uh, the sample size to get the same sort of significance that you would in GWAS. So we're gonna meet, need much, much larger sample sizes and on top of that, you're going to have to measure, for environments, you're going to have to measure the same environments in all of those samples. So it's, it's very tricky getting gene environment interactions uh, measured for bipolar disorder, which is why it's been so uh, understudied. And for gene environment interactions, just to list off a few, there's been some with uh, toxoplasmosis, um, child abuse, stressful life events, cannabis. And there's also been a couple gene-gene interactions, but all of these have had um, not very much replication. There's also the hypothesis for missing heritability that rare variation is what's uh, what could be driving some of the uh, heritability. And with that, it's whole genome and whole exome sequencing because of the, the prohibitive cost. It's usually been limited to small studies. And I'll talk about actually in the future directions that that could be changing soon. But right now, there's, it's only been limited to small studies, and these studies usually just have large pedigrees so that you have large families that can concentrate the amount of rare variants uh, to increase the power to detect rare variants. And there has been evidence that there's rare, uh, rare burden in bipolar disorder, but it's nothing to the, to the degree that of which schizophrenia has uh, seen um, there. So, um, it seems like rare variants might have a role in bipolar disorder, but it's not going to be as large of a role as, it, as we found in schizophrenia. And the same is true for CNVs. So CNVs, it does appear that they do have a higher frequency of CNVs in bipolar disorder than controls, but it's less than that than observed in schizophrenia and also neurodevelopmental disorders. And there's really only been uh, one replicated CNV um, associated with bipolar disorder. And moving this along to clinical impact of all of these genetic findings is moving into pharmacogenomics. And bipolar disorder is typically treated with mood stabilizers or antidepressants or antipsychotics. And pharmacogenomic studies have kind of been limited in bipolar disorder, but they are growing in size. 
the largest GWAS of lithium genetics, which lithium is one of the, uh, the most popular mood stabilizers for bipolar disorder. Uh, this study had over 2,500 patients treated with lithium, but only found one genome-wide significant loci associated with treatment response to lithium. So just like bipolar disorder, it seems like we'll need much more sample size in order to see uh, what is predicting treatment response, uh, at least to lithium. And beyond the GWAS, uh, polygenic risk scores have also been used in, in uh, pharmacogenomics. And it's been shown that, for instance, that schizophrenia uh, risk, the genetic risk, and depression genetic risk can pr predict worse response to lithium. And uh, something I have talked about now at uh, WCPG is that ADHD genetic risk also predicts worse response to lithium. There's also been a study, a, a very small study of other mood stabilizers in bipolar disorder. And this was an extremely small study with 199. But even with this small study, we did find um, two genome-wide significant hits with, um, in genes that, were, that made sense. Uh, so that's uh, an interesting study uh, to include here. Um, but as is the case with a lot of different uh, pharmacogenomics, it's been harder to, to figure out what predicts treatment response, but it, we've had a lot more success in figuring out uh, what predicts serious adverse reactions. So with that, we can genotype a patient and then tell them whether they shouldn't take a medication rather than what they should take. And in bipolar disorder, it turns out that there's HLA haplotypes that predict serious adverse reactions um, related to carbamazepine, lamotrigine, and others. So PRS prediction is the last thing I'll talk about here. And, and that's one way that you can have clinical utility uh, or clinical uh, implications for uh, the genetic findings. But Unfortunately, in the latest paper, we show that the best PRS derived from bipolar disorder GWAS explains less than 5% of the variation in case control phenotypes. So right now, as is the case with any other psychiatric disorder, PRSs are really not clinically useful at this point, um, at least for predicting case control status. But they can still be useful in, in understanding um, the heterogeneity within bipolar disorder. And the heterogeneity in bipolar disorder uh, getting dissected through uh, polygenic risk scores, we've seen that higher schizophrenia risk is associated with uh, type 1 bipolar disorder, which aligns well with clinical um, observations. And also schizophrenia risk is associated with um, psychosis and bipolar disorder, typically during mania. And we also see that depression genetic risk is associated with suicide and ADHD genetic risk is associated with rapid cycling. So all of these things are sort of lining up well with the clinical outcomes, and uh, these sort of findings can lead us to have uh, better diagnostics and potentially better therapeutics. So with that, um, future directions for bipolar disorder and the genetics of bipolar disorder. One of the big pushes from the latest PGC-4 is that we'll have increased ancestral diversity and with that, if you look at the latest um, GWAS in, uh, from the PDCBD group, uh, it only contains European ancestries in that GWAS. And so we've actually committed to expanding this beyond, uh, beyond that to other ancestries in the next, um, the next wave. And Kevin O'Connell will actually talk about how we included 23andMe, uh, which has a large diverse sample into the current GWAS that is in the um, Med Archive paper. As I mentioned before, um, sequencing efforts are going to be needed. Larger sequencing efforts will be needed. And something that's already been ongoing is the Bipolar Sequencing Consortium. And this now includes 4,500 cases and 9,000 controls. And so they have yet to publish their results, but um, it's also noted that uh, we'll likely need over 25,000 cases before we get really get a good sense of what rare variant um, contributions are being made to bipolar disorder. On top of that, we'll need increased deep phenotyping. So as I mentioned, there's high clinical heterogeneity, and a lot of this heterogeneity in the disease can 
reduce the variance explained because bipolar disorder might have different looks of how of, of what the patients might look like. And so understanding this heterogeneity would, would really inform the nosology and drug development for bipolar disorder. So it's going to be a, a next effort and, and it's ongoing efforts with the PGCBD group to collect more um, samples with all of this information about rapid cycling, psychosis, suicidality, um, ADHD, all of these different sub subtypes. And on top of, of wanting to get deeper phenotyping, uh, as I mentioned, we are now at the inflection point for our, our GWAS. And so in order to really get um, more gains in the variance explained in the trait, we will need larger GWAS samples. And to do that, we will need to look at other uh, different ways to ascertain bipolar disorder. In addition to including 23andMe, where we'll be reaching out to um, other diverse um, uh, populations and we'll have to um, continue recruiting uh, across the world as we move along to try to get a larger GWAS sample. So with that, I'll just thank you for your attention and I hope that you enjoyed the genetics of bipolar disorder. Thanks.